Great, we are officially recorded. So today I'm joined with the wonderful individual, Mark Brantley. He's the premier of one of the most incredible countries I've ever been to in my life. This country called Nevis, which is part of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now, in today's conversation, we're going to have a look at what national identity means. And more important, really plunge headfirst into the Caribbean as a whole. So first and foremost, Mark, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I want to express my best wishes to you and to your audience, and uh, especially to those who might be viewing in India. Of course, we are very close to India. We have a passion for cricket, like India does. Uh, unfortunately, you have been beating us up pretty badly lately, but uh, we remain hopeful that our glory days will come back for West Indies cricket. Uh -huh. I think it's in... I was going to say, I'll make sure I'll give Ricky Scary a phone call just to tell him that he needs to do his oh, job better. <laughs> absolutely. He needs to do better. Absolutely. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis is, of course, the smallest country in the hemisphere. Uh, we're the smallest in the Caribbean. And we would have obtained our independence, uh, having been a former British colony, much like India, uh, in, in 1983. Since then, we have been trying to make our way in the world. I think that on balance for a very small country, we have done remarkably well. Uh, we enjoy a fairly high standard of living. We enjoy a, a very stable, uh, democratic country where we have a very high respect for the rule of law, uh, an independent court system, and a parliament that is established in a government system that is established along the Westminster model uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, I feel that we have made mistakes along the way naturally, but on balance, our country has functioned well and we continue to try to improve our transparency, improve our governance, and improve our standard of living for our people. Incidentally, we have become quite popular with uh, Indian businessmen and women who have set up businesses here. In fact, much of our duty-free operations uh, here at our ports are controlled by persons and investors from India. As I like to say, we welcome more uh, of that. We would definitely like to see uh, more uh, Indian uh, nationals being here, being part of our mix. And so consider this uh, a request for Indian businesses to come in, Indian investors to come in, and Indian professionals uh, who wish to assist in our development to, to come in as well. As you know, the Caribbean generally has had a long history with India. And in countries like Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, we have a very large now indigenous Indian population. That is not the case in all of the islands, but in recent times, we have seen more Indians gravitate into St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, many are coming here for med school because we have some very well-established offshore medical universities and many are coming to invest and to do business. And so for me, this is a, an amazing platform. And uh, while my time here is limited because we are in the throes of a political campaign at the moment, uh, I wanted to come in and spend a few minutes with you. No, Mark, that's, that's very fun. I think one thing that really strikes me when you go to a country like Nevis in particular is that you almost, it's one of those locations in the world where everybody's impeccably polite. I remember going on an island, I got my boat over and the guy said, where do you need to go? I said, look, I need to go to Charles. And he goes, take my car. I said, but you don't know me because we're not going to drive off anywhere. And so you've got this innate politeness that almost finds its way through. And obviously you've got the killer bee that I think many people have been stung over as well. What is the identity of a country like Nevis? What makes it so special? Because out of all the 60 odd countries now that I've traveled to, is the only location that ret retains this type of form of authenticity that you can't really find anywhere else. I think you've summed it up far better than I could. <laughs> uh, I think that the reality is that we are authentic. I like to say we are how the Caribbean used to be. Because while Nevis has modernized and certainly all that you require in high-speed internet, all the connectivity that you want, uh, the transportation links that you want, but we have retained that Caribbean uh, flavor. You see quaint signs in Nevis like monkey crossing. Uh, you have to slow down to allow the monkeys to cross the road. Uh, our speed limit is uh, uh, ridiculously uh, low, 20 miles an hour. We have no traffic lights. We don't allow fast food chains on the mm -hmm. island. So we have done certain things that perhaps are different to the rest of the crowd. And uh, we have uh, really walked our own path. But for me, the real asset on an island this size is, is our people. And I'm happy you had that experience because I think our people uh, have always been the, the difference. They're the ones who set us apart from what is offered elsewhere. 
And what you get is very genuine. Uh, it is not put on for a visitor. This is how we live with each other. This is how we greet and interact with each other. And we have a saying here that you're only a stranger once on Nevis. So once you arrive, by the next time you come, people know your name, they yeah. know what you like to drink, they know, you know, and people interact with you that way. And so Nevis has a very uh, well-honed uh, tourism industry, which is largely based on repeat visitors, because people who come keep coming back. And that has been our sort of a selling point over the years. Uh, as a people, I think we have, uh, we have a deep reservoir of resilience. We have been a very resilient people. We're very hardworking, very honest, very forthright. Uh, sometimes quiet, and I think uh, oftentimes, particularly in politics, people misconstrue that quiet demeanor for, for sometimes, you know, weakness, but it's not, it's just our nature. Uh, we're not a quarrelsome people at all. We are people who embrace others in a very distinct way. If I can just for a moment tell you about tourism, uh, Nevis has the Bath Hotel, which has the thermal springs, and we are told by the historians that this is uh, was the very first luxury resort built in the entire Caribbean. And we're talking back in the early 18th century. So the reality is that Nevis has had a very long history insofar as hospitality and welcoming visitors to our island is concerned. Uh, we like to think that we are were among the original uh, destinations for tourists uh, to come. And our thermal baths, uh, quite famously, we had a royalty from the United Kingdom used to come here because of the reputed uh, curative value and therapeutic value of our baths. So Nevis has had a long history. It is a proud history. It is one that clearly has had its difficult periods. For example, we went through, uh, just like the rest of the region, a period of slavery. But I think we've emerged from that people who are at peace with themselves and the people who understand themselves. We understand that we are imbued with that Nevisian spirit. And as a consequence, we are very welcoming to people who come in. We are not threatened. Uh, we welcome. And so I'm happy that uh, you were loaned a car. I hope you drove it on the left side of the road where we drive here and uh, that you drove it well. And we're, well, clearly you're in one piece still. So that's a good thing. Uh, 20, miles an, uh, 20 miles an hour, you can't go wrong. So you know, I, I don't think you can. But I know on the other side of Nevis, you've got this incredible manga festival. You have the sailing boats. I know that you are known to many as being an amateur chef as well. So you are a culinary <laughs> god out there. And then you've got this incredible financial center as well. You've got this epicenter. What's really fascinating, though, is that obviously as part of the Federation, you have St. Kitts on the other side of the island. And what's really amazing is the stark differences between the two places. Yeah. What created that? Because most people imagine two locations, two islands, fairly close, swimming distance for some elite athletes, that is. But yet, culturally, in terms of the mindset of the people, it feels almost like worlds apart. Well, the two islands are just two miles apart at the closest point. And so you're absolutely correct. In fact, each year we have an annual swimming contest where swimmers swim from Nevis to St. Kitts, uh, that two miles straight. And, uh, you know, very good swimmers do that in about 11 or 13 minutes or something like that. So it's, 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 it's incredible what they do um, and how they do it. Uh, so the truth is that um, that we do have we do have um, you know a, a high degree of connectivity and, and interconnection between the two islands. We have people marrying each other. We go back and forth. We have a phenomenon now what we call the water taxis, like Uber. Yeah. You pick up the phone, you call a water taxi at two o'clock in the morning. So oh, is, is that absolute are, James Bond lifestyle, isn't it, Mark? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. people are leaving Nevis, going to St. Kitts to party, to you know, go to the casinos, whatever. Uh, people are leaving St. Kitts to come to Nevis if they feel like you know having, uh, you know, an expensive dinner. We have some incredible dining options on Nevis, and so there's a great degree of of movement back and forth. Um, our people though are different. Uh, we like to say that we're two islands, one paradise. Uh, and we offer the yin and yang uh, of the tourism industry. Nevis is more upscale, more luxurious, more laid back, uh, quiet. It's a kind of place where, you know, wealthy Indian businessmen and women who have, uh, who want to escape the hurly burly of, of, of you know, Delhi uh, would come to Nevis to just recharge and, and, and find themselves again, bring their families. We are very friendly insofar as families are concerned. And a lot of what happens in Nevis is really geared around that uh, sense of, of, you know, a holistic, you know, human development. In fact, our tagline for our tourism is Nevis naturally. So we emphasize very much nature, 
and what you can do here. So a lot of what you see here, the fishing, the sailing, the diving, the snorkeling, the beaches, it's all natural, the mountains, you know, the mountain hikes. And so the idea here is, you know, we rejuvenate the spirit. And that's what Nevis does. Sinkis is, is on the other side of that. So Sinkis is a hurly burly, you know, the traffic, uh, the fast food, the casinos, the nightlife. And so we really, I think, offer people the best of both worlds. It's, there are other twin island or multi-island countries in the Caribbean, Bahamas, for example, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda. But none of them can offer what Sinkis and Nevis does simply because of our proximity. You can literally stay on Nevis. Say you want to stay at the Four Seasons Resort. You want to rent a posh villa here for you and your family. You can do that, but go to St. Kitts for a day trip or go to yeah. St. Kitts because your, your teenage kids want to party at night. Uh, you know, this is how the two islands have evolved. Our people, I think, are different because we've had a different experience, notwithstanding our proximity. Uh, the people of Nevis got out of sugar production very early. The plantations in Nevis failed. Most of the planters fled back to the UK. And uh, slowly what happened was those that they left behind, or well, my ancestors, would have slowly taken over a lot of the lands. So the people of Nevis over time have acquired land and land ownership, I think, has lent itself to a certain spirit of independence that our people in Nevis have had. On St. Kitts, on the other hand, they persevered with sugar until very, very late. In fact, they didn't close down the sugar industry in St. Kitts until about 15 years ago. So a lot of lands in St. Kitts were still locked up in sugar production and St. Kitts was still very much an agrarian society for a very long time. I think now Sinkits has changed that. They've got out of sugar. And so people in Sinkits are now owning land and you know, accessing real estate, which I think builds that connection and gives you that, that, that sense of owning it's a piece of your isn't it? Because you feel like Absolutely. you're part, part and participant of the local society. Nevis strikes me as being a country that the world can learn from because you've been very future facing, even when you started your economic development, you diversified the economy. Now that's well and good before, but obviously with COVID comes a time for revenue replacement. And there's been one tagline that's been going out there, people have been looking at this notion of citizenship by investment, something that we've covered a lot on the platform, especially considering where the global Indian community are right now. What does the future look like for a country like Nevis that has had to deal with the likes of COVID, that's had to deal with the recession, and also now that some of the political mismanagement that's taking place across the Caribbean, and yet you've got a country that is almost a shining star for the rest of the people can follow? Well, first of all, I think our journey through COVID has been remarkable. Um, we have kept debts to an absolute minimum. We have kept hospitalizations to a minimum. Our vaccination rate is now in the high 80 plus percent. Uh, we have done really well. And every chance I get, I want to thank uh, Prime Minister Modi and the government and people of India, because it was through their humanitarian efforts in making vaccines available to St. Kitts and Nevis and the rest of the Caribbean that allowed us to start our vaccination campaign well before the COVAX facility was able to deliver vaccines to us. India had come to our aid. And so I continue to be grateful and I continue to say that on any platform that I have that I think uh, persons from India will uh, view that India really stood up with us during this pandemic. And for that, we are grateful. Uh, you are right. I think the pandemic taught us that tourism alone cannot be our future in terms of economic sustainability. It is still a critical part of our economic matrix, but it's clear that we have more work to do and citizenship by investment has been with us. In fact, I'm quite proud that in 1984, yeah. all those years ago, the country of St. Kitts and Nevis, just one year into our independence, gave the world this idea of leveraging citizenship for investment. Today, it's a global billion dollar industry involving countries like Malta and Cyprus and Portugal and even the United Kingdom with their golden visa program. Canada had some program that they used to attract wealthy Hong Kong residents to, to uh, places like British Columbia. We have the United States with the EB-5 visa program. We have countries that have seen the value in this idea that came out of St. Kitts and Nevis. We have in the Caribbean now, Dominica, St. Lucia, Grenada, Antigua and Barbuda all of which are also seeking to offer some form of citizenship by investment. But we continue to be the Rolls Royce of the industry, in my view. We continue to emphasize our due diligence 
And the Cingus Nevis passport is now the most uh, powerful passport in the entire Caribbean, allowing us to access over 162 countries and territories globally. Well, then, what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions people then have towards a jurisdiction like St. Kitts and Nevis? Because when you hear reports and dealing with the elephant in the room, it's only a couple of months ago that the Prime Minister of St. Kitts disbanded most of his ministers. Does that send the right message out there at a time where the EU, North America, all your big strategic partners are looking down your throat, asking pertinent questions? Well, I mean, the prime minister did what he did because he lost the majority in the parliament. And under our constitutional system, if one loses the support of the elected majority, then one loses the basis on which one can be prime minister. He certainly doesn't want to accept that inevitability. And so certainly he has taken some actions which we think are unfortunate. Uh, regardless of the views that, that he has taken and the path on which he has embarked, our constitutional mechanisms are in place and we have to have an election within 90 days. Uh, and so the clock is ticking and it's only a matter of time. And that's why I said to you that I've taken a moment this morning because I'm actually on the campaign trail at this point. I think though that the world should see this like it sees it anywhere else. There will be political uh, differences from time to time the question for me is how are we resolving those differences? You're not seeing any violence, you're not seeing any resort to protests in the streets and property being damaged. The country is peaceful, we're going about our business and in the fullness of time, our people will vote. And I think they will vote for a new government and I hope to be a part of that new government when they do so. Uh, I believe the existing prime minister lost his way. It is said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I believe along the way, he lost his way. And he's not the first to have done that. I think globally, we see difficulties with leadership in all countries in the world. But for me, it speaks to the maturity of our democracy, that we have mechanisms in place that will ultimately address that, and that our people will ultimately make their decision at the ballot box. And so for me, that speaks well to our maturity. It speaks well to the fact that when political differences arise, which they do from time to time, that we have the mechanisms to resolve them. Going back very quickly, though, if you'll allow me to the issue of the economy, um, during the height of the COVID, we pivoted very hard in Nevis to agriculture. We mm -hmm. think that that has to play a more critical role in feeding ourselves, especially now with global food prices rising. Food sustainability is critical to the island of Nevis. We pivoted to the movie industry. And it's, it's really uh, an interesting development because in the past year and a half, in the height of COVID, we have produced six movies on the island of Nevis. Uh, we also are looking at things like cryptocurrency and this whole notion of where the future in terms of financial services is going to go. And we are quite willing to engage in setting up the necessary ecosystem and infrastructure to allow that to occur. So the truth is that we have not remained stagnant. Uh, throughout this, we have been looking for ways to diversify our economy, to attract investment from outside, to continue our traditional uh, view that we need investment for property development and the like, but to also say that there are other strings that we can uh, give to strengthen our bow. And I think that's the strength of a nation like Nevis for the fact that you haven't sat back on your laurels. You constantly look towards the future and say, well, what if? How can we reimagine the future? Yes. And you're showing also you have much more meaningful local content hiring. Not in the sense that we've seen across the Caribbean, fortunately, whereby people build big hotels and maybe, and if maybe they'll hire local people for that. But in Nevis, you've really taken on that custodianship of cultural capital, as well as knowledge capital. Do you have a plethora of banks that have been set up? You obviously, as you rightly said, you're looking towards the crypto area and you've also got areas of renewable energy. I know there's been a lot of projects on Nevis. You've been looking at geothermal energy for quite a while there. Yes. Do you think the Caribbean can learn more from a country like Nevis? Am I, am I almost flagging, flying the flag of Nevis a bit too hard on the show here, but... Um, no, um, I think there is, you know, uh, let us face it. I think with, with small size comes certain limitations, but it also makes us perhaps more nimble. It makes us uh, better able to adjust quickly uh, to change course. Uh, during COVID, for example, we, were, we jumped on that situation immediately. We were one of the first countries to respond and we responded in a very strong way. I think it kept people safe. 
It was an unpopular message. I think a lot of us spent a lot of political capital uh, trying to encourage our people to get vaccinated, trying to get our people to wear a mask and do all the things that we were told we had to do. But the result speaks for itself in terms of the numbers. We have the lowest incidence of COVID in the region. We have the lowest deaths in the region per capita. And we have now been uh, um, said by agencies such as the CDC in the United States to really have had the best record in relation to COVID and COVID management. So I think part of it is the ease, or should I say the flexibility that size gives you. You know, in, in the, even in the animal kingdom, they say that, you know, little animals tend to be faster or they are given some additional asset to survive. Uh, bigger animals which have size tend to be a bit slower. Uh, and so that I think is part of it. And I won't dismiss that because in larger countries, it is much more difficult to turn that wheel if you will, you know, when you're dealing with millions and millions of people here, we're just dealing with maybe 13 or 14,000 people. So it is difficult, but also different. And we have some inbuilt advantages of speed and our ability to be flexible. Having said that, I think we've also been gifted with good leadership here. Leadership that is solid, leadership that is, is stable, leadership that has not been given to, you know, emotion and emotional reactions. And so when challenges come, uh, I have tried my very best as the leader of this island to, to look at it, to get the advice of our experts, to look and see what other countries in the world are doing, and ultimately to make the best decision for our people. And for me, that has been important. And so throughout this whole pandemic and throughout this difficulty, the island of Nevis has really maintained our standard of living, and we have been quite consistent. Of course, we have pockets of poverty. Of course, we have pockets of unemployment. But I believe that the situation here is definitely improving. I suppose I have to ask the question, Mark. You're you're incredibly talented at what you do. Obviously, you're a former lawyer as well. Your law firm did incredibly well down Ireland. Why join politics? Why enter? Because it would, it would have been very easy for you to continue your business, to grow it forward. Sure. And especially with what you've seen in St. Kitts currently, is it a headache worth taking on? I think it's, it's a headache work taking on. I think my we don't have time to get into too much about where you know my life's path, but I, I grew up in, in rural Nevis in a very poor uh, family, a very poor environment. I like to say that we were all poor, but we didn't know it. Uh, you know, With the benefit of hindsight, we now realize how desperately poor we were. And I am where I am today because a lot of people helped me. You know, I won scholarships to go to high school. I won scholarships to do my A-levels. I won a scholarship to the University of the West Indies. I won a scholarship to Oxford University. Uh, and I always had that sense that I had to pay it on, so to speak, or pay it forward, as they say, that I had to do more than simply come back and be the top lawyer in the region and make a lot of money. Because at the end of the day, for me, uh, making money is good. It allows you to finance a certain lifestyle, but uh, how do you help people? That ultimately is what I think a life is measured by, the quality and, and degree to which one serves others and assists others. And so many people have been kind to me in my lifetime and have allowed me to be where I am today that I thought that politics gave me an opportunity to help others. And I will tell you and your audience that one of my greatest uh, achievements thus far is the young people that I have seen who I've been able to get a scholarship for because they're from poor families like I was and they're able to go off to university and come back and I remember seeing one young lady one day you know walking in her heels in a beautiful suit as if she'd come off the cover of Vogue magazine uh, walking in Charlestown and I looked at her and I said my god you know this was one of the young people that I fought hard for she got a scholarship she went away she's back now speaks fluent Mandarin uh, because she studied in Taiwan. And you know, these are people who perhaps otherwise would never have got that opportunity. And so for me, that is what the value of politics is. You have to deal with the messy stuff as we're seeing in St. Kitts at the moment. That happens, but you know, how do they say diamonds are created by you know, immense pressure on, on, on coal? I think I heard it suggested, you know? So out of that, you know, you get a great omelet because you have to break some eggs. Uh, so I think we deal with the messy part of the politics, but the value for me is a service to our people and making people's lives better. Mark, I think it's an absolute pleasure to hear from you. I wish you the very best for the campaign trail. Thank you. I wish that there's more politicians like you across the Caribbean, across the globe, because surely then we wouldn't have the problems that we're facing right now. 
Well, thank you for the opportunity. Again, thank you for this uh, exposure to your wide audience. And remember my appeal that I need more Indian businesses and Indian investors in Nevis. So we look forward certainly to engaging with you. And perhaps after the election, I can come back. You will either be speaking to me as one who's victorious or as one who's been vanquished. Either well, e way, either way, we're I would love the conversation. We're, we're going to be cooking in your garden for your legendary Absolutely. barbecue. So that shall happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care. Take God care. bless. Thank you, Mark. All right.